Well, it's my pleasure to welcome you back to session four in our topic on expository preaching. You know, as a boy, we had a saying in the United States that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. We would often say that just after someone had said something to us that had truly hurt. Words of rebuke or maybe words of mocking, words of sarcasm. Truth is, words hold great power to hurt. They can cause great pain in our lives, oftentimes continuing with us even for years. Words are powerful and fascinating things. It's amazing to think about that I can take sounds from my mouth or I can put shapes on a page and I can share what's inside of my heart and deeply impact you and others. I can create joy or encouragement. I can cause fear or pain. And I can do this by using symbols that we as a group have assigned meaning to so we can share understanding. And this shared meaning gives words their great power. Words allow us to communicate, to organize, to share important concepts. Take some of the symbols we use in English. In English, if we have the letters S and N and O and W, really those are just shapes on a page. But if we put them together, English speakers know that that's a symbol we've agreed to represent frozen precipitation from the sky. In fact, in English, we have three to five words that refer to frozen precipitation. I can talk about snow. I can talk about ice uh, here in Texas where I live. We often have sleet and freezing rain, which is uh, something that causes havoc with driving. But did you know that there are Eskimo languages that have 26 words for snow? Differences for snow that can be traveled over or snow that you'll fall through. Differences for snow that can be built with or turned into a structure or snow that will not pack well. You see, survival in a snowy world requires that they can communicate precisely about snow. You know, there's other cultures that do not even have one word for snow because they are located on the equator and it is not anything that comes into their experience. I find it interesting that in Arabic, there are over a thousand words that refer to camels. How many words do we have in English? We have camel, maybe hump or spit or blanket. I, I, I don't know, but we don't have that many. But think about how many words we have that refer to our type of transportation. How many words are there that relate to cars and trucks? I can imagine there's far more than a thousand words for the car parts that go into your car and my car. You see, words are powerful tools. They help Eskimos survive in a snowy climate and they help us communicate our culture's values for transportation. Words help us understand and they help us to define our world and communicate meaning to others. Words help bring order and structure to an unstructured world. And the words are the primary tool of a pastor and a teacher. As we discussed earlier, a pastor fills many roles. You and your role of shepherding your church may involve cleaning your church facility, cutting the grass, handling the finances, managing the staff. But primarily, if you are a pastor, if you are a teacher, a shepherd, you are a communicator. And your primary tool are words. In the same way that a carpenter's primary tool may be a hammer, a surgeon's primary tool may be a scalpel, a communicator's primary tool is his words. And just as a skilled carpenter can use a hammer to build, a skilled communicator can build with words. And just as a surgeon can use a scalpel to remove disease and bring healing, a skilled communicator can do the same with words. In our first session together, we examined what is our primary task as pastors and shepherds and teachers. And we said it is to preach the word of God. In our second session, we saw why preaching is to be our primary task. It's because God uses his word preached through the mouths of his servants to build up and strengthen believers. In our last session, we looked at what kind of preaching should be our goal. And we saw that biblical preaching is truly expository preaching. We saw this illustrated by Ezra as he took small sections of the Bible and explained their meaning and applied uh, their expected impact on the people so that the people were convicted. They were changed. At the end of that session, we tried to give you a definition of expository preaching and a model outline 
for you to use as you begin to put together expository sermons. In our session today, we want to begin examining how we develop and present an expository sermon. And as we discuss how, we're really discussing the study and the use of words. In fact, the remainder of our course, the next nine sessions, will all address this issue of how we use words to communicate God's truth. The first part will focus on how we study the various types of words of the Bible. The second part will focus on how we use words to help our listeners understand and apply those words of God by building into sermons. In later sessions, we'll introduce detailed steps for studying and using words. But we want to begin today by focusing on the effort we are to invest to become skilled craftsmen. And so we want to do that by turning to our passage in 2 Timothy chapter 2. So turn there with me. We're simply going to look at uh, one verse. We're going to look at verse 15 of 2 Timothy 2. As you turn there, let me remind you of a couple of things on this book that we introduced as we were in 2 Timothy during our first session. This is Paul's final book written as he is about to die. It's written to Timothy, his understudy, his chief disciple. Paul, knowing his time is short, has a concern for the next generation of Christian leaders. And he uses over 30 imperative verbs. He gives commands throughout this book dealing with ministry. Many of them speak about Timothy's handling and preaching of the gospel. In chapter one, he called Timothy to contend for the gospel in spite of fear and doubt. In chapter two, he calls him to faithful ministry in the face of suffering. He does this using four metaphors as illustrations. He talks as a minister uh, in comparison to a soldier, to an athlete, to a farmer, and to a worker. Each metaphor addresses an area of Timothy's current life and are used by Paul to illustrate the proper action Timothy should take. The first three metaphors, those of soldier, athlete, and farmer, are very brief, each only taking a verse or two. The purpose of each of these metaphors is to show Timothy the value in enduring hardship. Paul says, Timothy, you stick with it because it'll pay off. It's worth it, Timothy. He says, a soldier avoids distraction, even enduring suffering to please his leader. An athlete follows the rules, even enduring suffering to win the prize. And a farmer works hard, even enduring hard work to receive the crops. So it's clear that Paul wants Timothy to endure hardship because it has a long-term reward. But what does enduring hardship look like for a Christian leader? Is Paul's expectation that Timothy would go into hiding, that he would just try to avoid the hardship or shun people, that he wouldn't compromise himself, but at the same time he would withdraw? Is Paul's expectation that Timothy would fight back, that enduring hardship would look like being a political activist or one who would stand and, and oppose the powers of his day? To answer this question, what does pastoral endurance look like while we wait for our reward? Paul gives Timothy a fourth and final metaphor. The three future looking metaphors were short, each only one verse. This metaphor is much longer covering the second half of chapter two. And it's this metaphor that we wanna look at during this session. So please turn with me to chapter two if you haven't already. And as you're turning there, let's begin looking at verse eight. Following the three short metaphors to comfort and encourage Timothy to faithfulness, Paul spends the next few verses stressing key truths that he wants Timothy to remember. In verse eight, he says, remember Timothy about Christ, the gospel and the word of God. In verse nine, he mentions his own suffering, stating that he suffers that others who are called might believe that his suffering is intentional. It's purposeful. These statements of God's faithfulness in the midst of Paul's suffering so that others might be saved sets up Paul's final metaphor in this chapter. It sets up Paul's call to Timothy for how he too should work in the ministry of the gospel. The final metaphor begins in verse 14 as Paul gives two commands. First, after having told Timothy, remember these things in verse eight, he says in verse 14, now remind them to others. Notice that Timothy's teaching is in the context of conflict. There are false teachers that Paul names later in the chapter. And Timothy is not to hide from those false teachers and he's not to stand up and fight them. 
What Paul wants Timothy to do is to study and to speak truth about Jesus and about the gospel in their presence. Second, he is to charge them or warn them not to quarrel about meaningless words. The word used here for arguing over words is only used one other time in the New Testament, referring to controversial questions that don't really matter. Here, Paul says they are useless and ruinous. So if we're not to quarrel over words, if we're not to just stand and share our opinions, what do we do with our words? Do we fall silent? Do we just speak out about others' errors? That is what Paul addresses in verse 15. Look at this metaphor with me. This is Paul's command to Timothy in the context of pressure and internal fighting within the church. He says, Timothy, be diligent. The word literally means to be in a hurry. It has the idea of valuing something so much that you want to make sure you're on time to get there. You make haste so that you're not late because you've got to get to it. it maybe your favorite team is playing an important game and you're in traffic and you are diligent. You make sure that you're in a hurry so that you can be on time for the very first play. This word became used in military settings for strenuous effort. I think it's interesting. This word is used five times in the New Testament. In, in essence, there's five things Christians are to value enough to be in a hurry over or to be diligent about. Three of them are eternal. Twice it speaks of salvation, that we are to be diligent to ensure our salvation. Uh, two of them are current. In Ephesians 4, we're to be diligent or be concerned and in a hurry about unity within our body. And then here in this passage, Paul says, Timothy, as you face opposition in your ministry, don't fall away. Don't grow silent. You work hard at something. You be in a hurry. If you're going to rush to do anything, I want you to rush to do this. And the rest of the verse tells us what it is that Timothy is to work hard about, to be diligent about. Look what he says. He says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. The word present has the idea to bring or place before. And it's often used in the uh, context of bringing a sacrifice to present before a king or before God. And his focus, Paul is saying, is should not be on fighting people. His focus should be on God. God is Timothy's audience and he should consider how he can perform for him. Paul says three further things about how Timothy should present himself. He says, first, he should do it as a workman. He will be evaluated as, notice the word, a worker, a laborer. This is the word Jesus uses in the parable where he's talking about the father hiring day laborers to work in the vineyard. Timothy is a day laborer. He's hired help. And he is a man who will give an account to his boss. He will give an account to God, Paul says. And so he is to work well. The previous metaphors ended in gaining approval. And here, Timothy is to work to ensure that, that he receives that approval. We see that in the next phrase, that he is a workman approved by God, that God will evaluate him. God will either approve of his work or not. There's ministry that we do that is approved by God, and there's ministry that people do that is not approved. He modifies this one step further by saying that he is to be a workman approved uh, by God who does not need to, to be ashamed. So what does diligence look like? How is Timothy to be a proven worker? Paul gives one last clause to clearly state what type of worker is approved and not ashamed. Look, look at the end, the last clause there in verse 15. He says, you are to present yourself approved of God as a workman, not ashamed. And this is how accurately handling the word of truth. The evaluation of your work and my work as a pastor, as a shepherd, is that we accurately handle the word of truth. Paul warns Timothy that his work, which is handling the word of truth, which is teaching, will be evaluated by God. And job success, the success criteria by which he will be evaluated is not excellence. It's not the size of his church. It's not the cleverness or the freshness of his stories. It's not his charisma. Paul tells Timothy and tells all of us as pastors and teachers that God will evaluate us for our accuracy. My job when I stand before God's people is not give my opinions. My job is not to be creative or relevant or clever. My job is to clearly and accurately explain God's word. 
Now, there's nothing wrong with creativity or relevance or clever presentation. We should never bore people with God's word. But we must remember these are secondary issues. The most important thing about my presentation is accuracy. You may think of us as a tour guide, a pastor as a tour guide at a historical site. A tour guide, if you go to some great battlefield, doesn't share novel thoughts or exalt themselves or, or try to give new interpretations. The, the job of a tour guide is to simply show you what is there, to highlight what has happened and to lift up what has been done. That is what a pastor is. My job is to highlight the text, to show you what's there, to lift up what's been done by God for us so that our people will understand and, and experience God in new ways. The word accurately is interesting to me. The word literally means to cut straight. It's used several times outside of the Bible in first century Greek. In one use, it's used of a mason who cuts stone, that he cuts the stone straight, a straight edge. Another is used of a farmer who's plowing his field and that he's cutting a straight row for his crops. My favorite is that of an army who's cutting a road through a forest. In the army, the idea is that as the army goes into this forest that is unpassable and it fills in the low spots and it removes the high places and it takes down the trees so that something that is difficult, something that is unpassable is now made clear and passable. It's made safe. The trees are removed so access is granted. We handle the Bible in the same way. So that like a stonemason, who works the stone to show its beauty, or a farmer who lines a crop so that it can be easily harvested, or an army who makes a road that now new places can be accessed. A pastor is to be accurate and communicate in such a way that when others hear us, they look at a paragraph of the Bible and they say, of course, I see it. How did I not see it before? It's so clear. It's so beautiful. It's, it's now able to be harvested and put into my life. That which was unclear and hard to understand becomes easy to understand because of our teaching. So do you see the passage? Paul writes to a young pastor who's discouraged because of difficult ministry. He tells him to live with an eye to the future, knowing there's going to be a great reward. And also that we will give an account for the ministry that he does now. As a result, he says that Timothy is to work hard, not in politics or revolution, but in teaching. Timothy is simply a day laborer who is to labor at accurately handling the word of truth. As we close, I'd like to briefly share with you four principles of Bible study that are key foundation stones of effective, accurate Bible study. These are the bedrocks of accurate exegetical sermons, and these will serve as a foundation for all the study we'll do in future sessions. They're often called hermeneutical principles, and I like to think of them as the rules of a game. Take football, for example. There are many football games each day. Each game is unique. Different teams, different fields, different outcomes. But all football games are governed by the same rules. Whether it's a schoolyard game with a few players or a professional game on television, how you score points, where the boundaries are, how you uh, access the goals and what are penalties are based on the same rules. If you no longer follow these rules, you really are no longer playing true football. You could say these common rules are hermeneutical principles of football. Although each game has its own interest and excitement, they're all governed by these principles. In the same way, there are rules or principles for interpreting the Bible. They are true of all parts of the Bible, whether Old Testament or New Testament. In future sessions, we are going to talk about exegesis of individual sections of Scripture. You can say those are individual games of exegesis. What we want to finish our time with today is talking about the rules of hermeneutics that give us the guidelines for interpretation that apply to all the, the exegesis we will do. If you no longer follow these rules, you may be in the Bible, but you are no longer accurately studying and understanding it. There are many hermeneutical principles that people suggest today, but in this class, I want to focus just on four. The first is revelation. 
We believe that the Bible is a message given from God to his people. These are God's words. Therefore, the message of the Bible is vital to every person. And the exegete must strive, must discipline himself, must work hard to understand, explain, illustrate, and apply each section as a matter of life and death. The term for this is verbal plenary inspiration. We believe that every single word is God breathed. Every word of the Bible has importance. Every word of the Bible is worth my time and my study before I preach. The second is authorial intent. We believe that the original author's original intended meaning is the true meaning of a text. Therefore, my goal as an accurate exegete is to find, explain, and apply the author's meaning. When Paul wrote the book of 1 Thessalonians to the Christians in Thessalonica, why did he write it? What did he mean for that first audience to understand? That's what I need to study, and that's what I need to know, and then I need to apply that to my audience. The third is pastoral motivation. Authors of the Bible wrote with pastoral intent. They desired to communicate clearly. Therefore, we should expect as exegetes that they have written in a way to be as clear as possible, desiring their audience to understand their message and to know what they were saying. And so oftentimes the most basic meaning is the most likely meaning. An exegete should not be looking for hidden meanings in the text. We should study using the uh, accurate tools of studying a, a passage of scripture to help us understand what is the pastoral motivation of the author. The final hermeneutical principle is genre. In order to be clear, authors of the Bible wrote using the standard writing conventions of their day. In their day and ours, certain types of writing followed certain rules for communication. Examples of that are everywhere. If I were to stand here and say, once upon a time, you would not expect me to follow that up with a truthful story. Because we all know that once upon a time introduces a fantasy, a make-believe story. In America and in, in the West, we have something called knock-knock jokes. And if I say knock-knock, you immediately know to say who's there and you know to expect a very poor joke. That's the way knock-knock jokes work. Those are genres. And in the biblical days, there were genres for writing poetry, for writing narrative, for writing epistles, and writing apocalyptic and prophecy. And the authors followed the general principles, uh, the standards for writing in those particular genres. As exegetes, if we understand the genre and we know the rules that were followed by the writers, it helps us as we seek to interpret their meaning. During our remaining sessions, we're going to play the game of exegesis, studying specific passages of the Bible by following these four rules. The first three of the rules explain why we study so hard to make sure we are accurate. The text of God's word spoken to a historical circumstance by a pastor uh, has meaning that matters to us. The last rule, the one of genre, will impact how we will move on from here. In the next four sessions, we will dedicate ourselves to the exegesis and preaching of New Testament epistles. The final four sessions will be dedicated to the exegesis and preaching of Old Testament and gospel narrative. I want you to know, I feel this is where this course gets fun. This is where we get our hands dirty, and this is where God's Word comes alive. I hope you enjoy the rest of this course as much as I will as we go through it together.